So today we're going to be looking at material application, displacements, and bump maps. Okay, so what are those things? They're kind of different ways that we can apply materials to objects in Modo. So in Modo, we have two very important things that it can do. The first thing is that it can make form in kind of a really complex number of ways, and we're not nearly done looking at all of those, so we'll get there. There's lots of other ways to make shapes. Okay. The second thing it can do is it can apply materials. And its material application is really powerful, and it's what makes it kind of, I would say, ahead of it's ahead of the pack in many ways. Um, material application means that we can render things very realistically. We can control reflectivity. We can control the thickness of the skin, and we can control all sorts of kind of very natural qualities that have been turned into kind of computational models. So let's have a look at this. So what I've got, I've got an object. I'm going to go to model for now. We know about the render tab already, right? So in the model tab, I'm just going to make sure I have something I can work with. Subdivisions actually don't make that much of a difference. If you're trying to make a cube, you're making a cube. It's not the end of the world, right? It's just a cube. Um, but basically, in terms of this, we can... Um, just make some edits to it so it does something. Once we're there and you stop making that noise, we can go to the render tab. So in the render tab, let's have a look at what's going on here. Yes. Oh, to sculpt things like this? Yeah, sure. So we go to paint. Um, you'll see that there's sculpt tools, paint tools, hair tools, vertex map tools, particle tools, and utilities. So I'm under sculpt tools. Um, two things to notice. I'm fairly highly subdivided. Okay, probably too subdivided. Um, and then the other thing is when I pick up a tool, for example, inflate. I'm clicking and holding to find inflate. I can click here, and if my, my tool is too small, nothing's going to happen. Okay. So if I hold Command on my keyboard, so uh, for you it might be Control. You should try. Make it larger. Click and drag. Command, click and drag to make it bigger. You have a middle mouse button. Might be that that increases the size. So make your handle bigger, and then you can kind of inflate things in that way. And I'm on polygons when I'm doing this. I have polygons selected. I mean, the sculpting thing is not the end of the world. Um, I, this, this, is, this will be the, the I've already recorded something to do this. The main thing is to do with kind of applying materials. Did you manage to change the size of your brush? Did we have a look? Okay, so once you've created something that looks vaguely like a turkey, 
like me okay let's talk about material application guys it really doesn't matter if you don't have anything in your scene but if you need to be able to do this this is very important once I've created something I've used the regular paint tools my sculpt tools whatever I want to do I might have been in model the whole time and I've been just using like um, I've just been using poly polygon tools and I've decided I want to make this thing spiky okay that's what I've been doing the whole time um, you know what I'm saying something but now I want to add material qualities to this. We've already done this once before, so we kind of already know. We can select the whole thing as an item and we can color it that way, or we can select individual polygons and we can color it that way. For our sakes and purposes right now, we just want to apply one material to this, okay? Once you get your head wrapped around material application, you can do more complex things. But for now, one material at a time, okay? So, notice the following. In my in my my scene here, there's a mesh. I'm gonna select that mesh. It highlights it when I select it. I'm gonna press M on my keyboard. M for material. M. I'm gonna call this mesh one material. You can name this anything you want. Anything you want. Type anything you like there, okay? But just make sure you remember what you're doing. Keeping things in good control is a very good idea. We can also Set the color material, so I want this to be this really unnecessarily bright red, okay? We can set the diffuse, and we can set the specular. Specular is reflective. Press OK. And you'll see it automatically applies it to my object. Not so pleasant looking. Um, but such is life. We can obviously go, now we can have a look at a few more things. So inside items, you see I have a mesh, I have a color to it, but you'll see inside the item menu, you can't see any of the colors. That's because to look at colors, we need to go to the shader tree, okay? So, item menu, shader tree. We can go to the shader tree in multiple places. We can go right here in the modeling tab, or we can go to render. And over here, you'll see at the bottom, here's the shader tree right here, okay? Press play, and it's kind of where we're at right now. Do you notice that the 3D view underneath and the, the camera view above are identical? Do you guys remember that we can change this from camera? If we click on camera over here, we can change that to perspective. And so you can go back to just regular perspective view, which is exactly the same as you see in uh, the modo and the model view. Okay, so if we in render, oopsie, sorry. If we in render and we move this around, nothing will happen. But if we go to camera and we're in the render camera or just the current selection, when we move this around, we get a turkey lying on its side. Okay, well, it really does look like a turkey. Who remembers how to change the background color? Yes. We're going to talk about lighting soon, okay? It's, uh, it's a whole other animal in Moto. Um, but yeah, it can be any color. Notice that the object that you have is reflective and it reflects the background color, okay? So that, that can be really influential on, on the way it is. So there you go. It's my, per my blue background. You can see it right here. See my object is really reflective. Now let's explore the shaded tree just a little bit so you guys can get your head wrapped around that. So right now what you have in front of you is you have a shaded tree, you have your item list, we know we have a camera, we know we have a light. Don't worry about the light, you can move the light actually. So if you go to your model view, you can't see any light here, but remember if we click on the cog, we can. Um, we can show the cameras and the lights, so you can see where the light is. And you can always move the light just like any other object. But we'll get to lighting another point, okay, so just so you know it's doable. Um, and the render, so we have a camera. That camera, and let's go and have a look at that in the model view. That camera is pointing exactly the way that you, you know, that is the camera that you're looking through. So that view is what you get. And obviously that light and that camera work together to make the scene. 
okay so now let's have a look back in render you'll see that and I will quickly do this so I'm going to change one to perspective so you can see there's my perspective view there's my perspective view there's my camera view and uh, there's my rendering and so can you guys see the relationship that they all have with each other so the one at the bottom uh, sorry this items list right here this is what determines the setup of the very bottom view right we, we model we set up the camera we do whatever the, the, the middle one this one lets us know what the camera is gonna look like when we actually line it up okay and the top one is going to show us exactly the way our material settings are at play everything can be moved everything can be adjusted everything can be zoomed out and then Please have a look as I zoom out here. You'll notice that my camera is backing up and everything is kind of adjusting. Okay? Cool? Good to know. So how do we apply a material to an object? Select it as an item or as polygons or as anything actually. Okay. So just select it and if we don't select anything and we press M but we have the item selected, what happens? It will, it will materialize everything. Okay. So we have that. Let's quickly have a look at a little bit more detail so you can see. I'll go to the front view again and now I'll show you some other things. If I press 3 on my keyboard and I paint select this middle piece. I've already shown you this, this to you guys, but I've decided that's what I want. Press M, I'm gonna call this mesh, mesh one material two. And then we will pick this uh, color. I agree with you, you. So, What's kind of what's kind of weird here, and I know it looks terrible, is that we can see each polygon by its material assignment. Okay, so every polygon I selected, I applied the material to, then I get this kind of shitty material. Um, what's up? So you get this kind of bad material over here. Okay, and that's just because it's polygon for polygon. Which can be really fr which can be really frustrating. So my advice is actually just generally avoid applying like polygon selected materials. You can sometimes it works, but it's a, for the time being, you're gonna make chickens. Don't do that. And obviously undo will get you right out of the nonsense. Okay, so let's look at a few more advanced material application tools. Um, and then we can kind of, you can play with it a bit and then we can ask some questions. So, I'm going to close this. Okay. You're going to want to stick around for this. Um, so, give me, give me, give me five minutes. What you need to now know, and this is really important, is we need to be able to apply a material to our object. Material application doesn't mean necessarily only a color, right? It also could mean an image. And you guys have done a really good job already of collecting a very large selection of images, okay? So, let's, let's quickly go there. We'll go to Drive. I'm just going to use one of these for inspiration, but you've already got these kind of pretty, pretty amazing kind of textures, okay? So, I'm going to go and grab one of these uh, yellow three brush.
that's pretty nice. Okay, so I'm going to save this image. Okay, um, I'll put it there. You could even use one of the Razzle Dazzle boats if you wanted. We'll go back to Modo. So <coughs> this is a little bit different operation, but working in a similar way. Shading. We've already added a material. So you can see there's that material we applied. It says it's a mesh material one. So you've always got to do that. If you want to put a material on an object, you always have to apply a material to it. Now we're going to add a layer. Okay, you see the add layer button over here? Add layer. Image map. Load image. And so that's saying, like, oh, you want to bring an image in from the outside. I said, yes, of course I do. That's not what I want. That's not what I want. It's on the screen. Okay, so there's my image from the outside. Press OK. And so now we get this image application on here. It's not obviously not the best just yet because I'm just randomly projecting it. And so we have to start talking about projection in the next week as well. Don't worry. It's kind of a big deal, a big thing to deal with. So we'll get there slowly. But now if I press play, I get the same kind of, I get that texture on top of my object. And I can, I can pan around this. You'll see that it doesn't exist on the other side because of the way it's working. Okay. So that's just the application of that. Let's have a look at the few different ways it's getting applied. Um, when you'll see, it, it shows up right here. It's this little golden picture. It's actually a picture of Mona Lisa. They turned into a little thing here. Um, but this is it right here. And on the right-hand side, you'll see all under texture locator, you'll see all of the settings. Projection type is the first thing that you kind of will notice, and this is the thing that changes everything. If you change this from UV map to like solid, it projects it in a different way. It's basically about how it shoots the image at the object. When it's UV mapped, think of a UV map in this way. It's taken the shape of the object you've created, it's flattened it out into a flat skin, just like we would with an animal actually, and it's projected that picture onto the UV map and it's folded it back up. That's how UV mapping works. When we change from UV map to like front projection, um, You can then project it like through the camera, for example. So now it's taking the information from the camera directly, wherever the camera is at. So as I rotate, you see the image stays in the same place, but the object can move. It has its, it has its, you'll find your reasons for using things like this. Maybe not in this class, but other, other way. Cubic treats it like a cube. So here you can see the four sides of the cube, the way it's projecting it inwards. And so it's going to get a similar, you're going to see the frog on four sides, okay? Spherical, you can kind of see, you can see the sphere it's projected in. There's a little, it's a little kind of rounded thing. It's probably working quite nicely for us here because we already have a sphere we started with. Cylindrical, you can see the tube it's working in. You can actually see the pinch point at the at the bottom. Planar is a flat surface projection. It's like front projection. It shoots a flat image at something. It can be great for making walls, textures on walls, things like that. We'll get there. Solid, it's kind of just like a square projection. It's not as clear. Um, but I'm gonna go back to I'm gonna go back to UV map because I quite like the way it was doing it. It's kind of putting this leg in a weird place and things like that. We'll look at how to adjust UV maps at some point in the next few weeks, so don't worry about it. But for now, I'm just gonna leave it here. But if you don't like the effects of your projection, change it up. You know, like change the, the setting type. Um, you should theoretically be able to make it smaller, depending on what we're doing. Um, uh -oh. Okay, so, we have it like so. What now? Let's have a look at this shaded tree for a second. On the right hand side here, you're going to see that there is a material at the bottom, which is currently getting overridden by this material here. Okay, it's just like Photoshop. Mesh material one, you see inside that there's material and material PAF one. Okay, and that's because I think the image is called the image is called PAF one. Okay, so here you see there's PAF one image being imported. We have the material underneath, and we can turn this off if we want. We'll get the red image back. 
It's just like Photoshop in that way. And so we turn it back on, we get the image. We can also control the way it blends. Have you guys ever played with the blending tools in Photoshop? You know, like multiply, distort, whatever. Same idea. We can say multiply. And so here we'll get like a red colored frog. And so we can start to combine like the effect of various tools at various times. Um, let's try something else. It's been dark in it. You can uh, play with hard light or soft light. Anything that you really like. It doesn't... Um, yeah, it's up to you. <coughs> but that's not what we're really here for. What we're really here for is this. I'm going to make our life a little bit easier to see, so I'm going to make this a little bit larger. Okay. Um, here's what we're really here for. Once we've applied a material, we can add an image, so we know that much. I'm going to go ahead and add... Load an image. I'm going to load the same image. Okay. And I have two. Do you notice that it's reverted back to the original? Because it's you'll see it's no longer um, you'll see it's no longer under text delays, it's no longer multiplying. If you go to the other one, you'll see it's multiplying. Okay? So we've got the first one. What I want to do with this one is I want to use it as something that creates texture and not necessarily color. Okay? So Say I want every time there's a little black hole on the surface of the frog, I want it to create a little indent, okay? Uh, you can imagine it with a zebra or with anything, okay? I'm going to click here where it says diffuse color, and I'm going to type in here. Well, I don't even have to type it in. I'm going to look for it. I think it's under surface shading. So we're going to go down to surface shading, and we're going to use displacement, okay? Select displacement. Yes. And so now what's happening is that the black values of the picture are pushing back and the white values are pushing forward. And so now we can continue we can we can uh, we can we can enhance that a little bit. So we can bring up the high values so you want you make your your reds kind of pop a little bit more. And you want to push your blacks back a little bit minus 25. Yes. Is that what you mean by zoom in? Yeah. So you can actually see that there's a displacement happening on the surface, okay? You can see it here as well. If you want to make it, if it's more rigid, of course, if it's, if it's less subdivided, you get weirder textures. If it's, you know, it depends on the subdivision level. More subdivisions, better displacement. That's bottom line. And then obviously within some reason it will get too, dis too subdivided and your computer will crash. So, middle ground. But anyway, it's a great way to kind of create a... This is, this is a physical displacement. This is literal, the geometry from the frog is... The, the color of the frog is pushing the material off the surface. I'm going to click on this and I'm going to actually duplicate it because I can do it this way. I don't necessarily need to re-add it every time. And I'm going to hide part number one so we get that away. And I'm going to change displacement now, okay? So displacement is just one tool. Let's try something else. We go to surface shading. We're going to use bump, okay? Bump is very different. Can you see there's a little bit of texture on there now, but not that much. It feels a little bit, uh, I don't know how else to say it. You see, it feels like there's a little bit of texture on there. It's not so heavy feeling. So the difference between bump and displacement, displacement is a literal displacement of, of, of uh, vertex points. So it will take points on a surface and push them away from the surface at a certain value. Bump is creating extra added shading against edges. Like you see where the contrast is strong between the blue and the, the black over here. So in between those two moments, it creates like this extra little bit of shading in there, and I think it's it's a it's like a pure color-based operation. There's no geometry changes, because if you zoom in and around this, you'll see that it's all still really flat, but it's got a little bit of a texture. If I turn it off, it's flat. You see, and so if I turn it back on, it's not so flat. Can we use them at the same time? Yeah, sure. I don't really know why you would, but you can. It seems to kind of smooth itself out a little bit. And if you go to material settings at the bottom here, you can change the displacement distance if you want. So if you want to make this stronger, 
make it 100 millimeters, you could make it very spiky. And you can hear that my computer is roaring right now because it's doing a lot of work. So obviously I think you guys can probably in your heads tell, oh, well, this might be a, quite an easy way to, well, this just looks like something out of a computer game. Um, quite an easy way to kind of model the textures on some of your animals, I think, like apply a, a zebra texture or a rhino texture or something. It's there. It's very straightforward. All right, last one. Okay, we've tried displacement. What is displacement? Physical displacement of geometry. What is bump? Non-physical displacement of geometry to make it look like there is a displacement, right? It's all about faking three-dimensionality. Here's the reasoning for something like displacement, okay? The reason we use something like displacement is because sometimes we don't want to model, and this actually comes from the gaming industry, so if you ever played any of the like small, like massive world games where you have like lots of little characters with lots of little things like Diablo or whatever those games are called. Those games require, or World of Warcraft is a great one, or Dota, like those have lots of very small parts to them that need to be modeled very efficiently because they show up millions of times in a game, right? And so your computer has to be able to handle that. And so they use displacement so they can make a very simple geometry and they use displacement and bump so that they don't have to model all the little details. So that's kind of what they're doing here. It's a, it's a cheap trick, but it works quite nicely. Okay, last one of these three. We're going to do one more. So let's add, a material, let's, add, let's add an image together again. Add layer. You see that if we use the tool a lot, it will show up at the top here because it starts to remember. So that's quite nice. So I'm just going to click load image from here, but otherwise I go to image map and load image. Okay. I'm going to use this one again just so that you guys can continue to see its effects. What's going to happen? We're going to get it all the way on top. Why is it all the way on top suddenly again? The layers. What do we know about the layers? It's just like Photoshop. And whatever's on top is the boss. Okay. So let's do one more change here. We're going to change from diffuse color. And we're going to change this to stencil. So we actually just have to, I want to show you where stencil is at. So stencil is under it's under special effects. So hit stencil. So stencil is quite a weird thing and I will um, turn this off as well. Okay, so stencil cut out certain parts. So let's um, let's do this. There are a couple of things you have to remember to do. Select the stencil here. We go to the locator. Oh, sorry. Go to the texture layer over here. Um, first thing you want to do, if it's not looking so good right now, like there are a lot of blues that are that are solid, and we actually want the black holes to disappear. So we want to press invert. So now it's going to swap it around. So anything that's like Anything that's too dark will get cut out. Um, next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, no. I'm going to select double sided. So there's a couple of the only thing with the only thing is here, guys. You're going to take a while to get used to where everything is. Okay. Sometimes it's in the material. Sometimes it's in the actual tool. And so you just have to get used to this. Right now I'm looking for stencil. You'll see it's not working so nicely. I think you kind of get the idea. It's a little bit see-through. You know, it's supposed to be cutting away what's black and leaving what's white. Um, so here, if I go to the material and I change double, choose double-sided, now I kind of get the inside and the outside of the model. Not so clear yet. Let's, uh, let's do something a little bit more obvious. I'm going to add a new layer. Let's load an image from here. Uh, maybe we'll use one of these. Let's try this with a like very clear black and white parts. 
So here we have the image. If there's if it's white, it should it should stay. If it's black, it should disappear. Okay. So I'm going to change this from diffuse to stencil. You can always type in stencil if you want. Press enter. And so now if it's black, it's stuck around. If it's if it's uh, white, it disappears. Okay. Um, and if you don't have double sided selected, the inside disappears. And as you change the projection of this, so if I change this to like a solid projection, you'll see that the you see the ships show up kind of quite obviously now. You see? Why is it doing that? Because it's shooting it as a flat image as opposed to like a wrapped image. That's it. What does this have anything to do with anything you're doing? It has a lot to do with what you're doing. You'll use all these different kinds of projection in different ways when you're working with your model making, okay? Um, they can be very effective for creating textures, for making things feel more realistic, for experimenting with things, for prototyping ideas. Um, there are like a million reasons to use this. I can see you even testing like new facade systems, new glassing systems, new ways to create transparency or solidarity in the, in the, or in, in the space. There's lots of reasons to be doing this. So that's stencil bump and displacement, okay? Those are the basic three things I want to show you today. Um, I have an extra bonus piece right now that I'm going to quickly show you. That's always fun. You don't have to be here for this if you don't want to. No, you're good. So, Modo is something else built into it, which is quite new. Um, and it's called procedural modeling. Uh, what, is a pro what is procedural modeling? Procedural modeling is basically like, it's like history-based modeling where Modo remembers what it's already done. And so if you say to Modo, hey, I want you to create a cube. Okay, cool, thanks for the cube. Okay, I want you to do this to the cube now. Okay, great. Modo will remember every step. And if you want to go back and say to it, oh, I want more subdivisions on my cube at the very beginning step, you can still do that. What we normally do in Modo is that we do what we call terminal level modeling. So we make a cube, we drop it. So we pick up the cube, we do something to the cube, then we drop it. Then we pick up the cube that had something done to it, we do something else to it, then we drop it. Then we pick up the cube that had something done that had something done to it, then we do something, to, then we drop it, and then we do it again and again and again. Can we undo in that process? Kind of, with limitation, right? <coughs> in the procedural modeling limitations, it's, uh, it's a different kind of way of thinking about modeling, but it can be like basically infinitely undone and redone. And so we'll just look at a very basic example of it just to give you guys some idea. Okay. Create a new file. Go to items. You'll see that there's a second one along here called mesh ops. You see the mesh ops option over here? So you click mesh ops. So here we go. That's our item list. This is our mesh ops list over here, the app operator list. Don't worry if you don't follow this the first time, but it can be very, very, very valuable, especially if you're doing kind of I don't know, things with lots of the same item. Or, okay. So, I'm going to create a cube. And I'm going to do exactly what we would normally do. We're going to subdivide, right? But in this case, we're going to subdivide in a different way. We're going to subdivide using a command. So, I'm going to type subdivide. I'm going to press enter. And you see how it's just subdividing like that? Um, I'm going to subdivide, let's say, twice in this case. And so now you can see I've got subdivisions, but those subdivisions are limited. They're literally based on these subdivisions, so they can come and go as I please. Like if I want to unsubdivide, I can. If I want to resubdivide, I can. Okay. The the next thing we're going to do, and this is just to show you, we're going to use a tool called Jitter. Okay. It's a deform operation, and what does Jitter do? It just kind of it jitters things around. So let's let's add that. It doesn't seem like anything's happening just yet, but that's because of the following. <coughs> So here it's asking us for a range inside the jitter. And this is the one thing about tools in Modo is that often like you can apply the tool but nothing will happen because you actually have to tell the tool how much power it has. Okay. So now I'm going to change the tool and we're going to start to edit this. And so it will it will jitter your object for you um, like so. Uh, we're going to add a sub D, another one, maybe one more. And so you can see that 
the jitta itself is just uh, not so happy. So we'll go here. And so you can kind of see what it's doing. It's twisting the, it's twisting the objects around themselves. So you could use something like this to completely control, you know, like continuously control and animate something. You'll notice that they are whole, like a lot of things are very animatable. And so you can, um, yeah, anything with one of these little gray dots next to it, you can animate. So like this kind of jitter effect, you can, you can really, really have control over. Uh, let's do this. Yes. I'm going to sub, let's see. I'm going to sub that a few times before I do this. So I'll add operations, sub D, right. Okay, and then I will add a... Yeah, I mean, it's just for creating some basic kind of offsets. If you're creating, like, I can imagine, like, rhino skin or something. You might be able to do it subtly. Um, you see how it's breaking? I don't know. Oh, there you go. Sorry, I put my I put my subdivides on the wrong side of the jitter. So, so there you have the two subdivides on the right side. You can see the jitter effect here. You know, it's going to start affecting it. Let's make it a little bit more violent. We'll go to this subdivide, and so that's kind of the effect we're looking at. But what I like is that I can always come back here. I don't like it yet. It's not exaggerated enough. You know, I want to bring it to like something like this. There's no undoes, there's nothing. It's just like, oh, I don't like it yet. Okay, cool, I'm going to go and change a setting. Oh, I still don't like it. Okay, I'm going to go and change another setting. And so I like, I like that about procedural modeling. Whether or not we can all use procedural modeling yet for what we're doing is a whole other debatable thing. Um, also, a lot of these procedural modeling tools require quite a strong computer because the computer has to remember all the steps. So I'm not trying to put you off it. I'm just warning you that... A lot of this stuff was developed on kind of very big workstations, okay? But it's a really wonderful tool, and it has a lot of power. Um, we can even, you know, we can, they're, they're even like, we'll have a look at Fusion at some point, um, but they're even like Fusion operators that glue things together and create beautiful strips like bicycle helmets and lots of like industrial design objects. I'm sure you've seen what I mean. You know the bicycle helmets that have the beautiful perforations in the top? Those kind of cut-throughs that seem like the magic machine made that? It's done in software like this with like custom cutouts. You can change the pattern every time. <coughs> okay. So those are the basic um, those are the basic tools for today. Um, if you want to know what's in the assignment, you could sit down for a second more. This is killing me right now. You can go. What? Yes.